So May the 10th, 2023, we're going to be talking about Alexander and, and language, Alexander and Alexander language and other languages. So as you all know, we have been using in these seminars many different languages to help us understand what we do in the Alexander world. We've, we've used language like the polyvagal theory, language of self-regulation and co-regulation. We've used language from Gabor Mate, compassionate witness. We've, we've used language of the relationship of I Thou, inspired by Martin Buber's essay, I Am Thou. We've used some understanding from Freud. We've used Tom, Thomas Hubel's understanding of post-generational trauma. We've used somatic experiencing, some of their language about how we need to re-experience or remember in order to resolve and transform. So there are many sciences and theories out there that I think help us understand what we do. And I recently posted something up on one of the Alexander forums about polyvagal theory and it got some interesting responses. Uh, one particularly interesting was response was that the polyvagal theory has been debunked quite a while ago. My, my initial response was, well, if, that, if that's what debunking does to polyvagal theory, then I hope we get debunked very, very quickly. <laughs> because polyvagal theory or its applications, people that have seen value in some of the theories of the polyvagal theory are very much in, in the zeitgeist. They're very much around today in conferences, trauma conferences, somatic therapy conferences, embodiment conferences, that Stephen Porges' ideas are very much around. Now, I fully accept, and I'm no scientist, that a number of elements in the scientific experimentations of polyvagal theory, the intricacies of the arousal ladder, the explanations of the dorsal vagal system can be invalidated. They can be shown to be not accurate. And that's fine with me. I'm not here to support or examine the intricacies of all the science behind the idea of polyvagal theory. That is not my intention at all. For me, I'm excited by the Alexander technique. I'm excited by what happens in the two-person game between teacher and pupil. I'm excited at the potential for transformation that happens in a good Alexander session. And I am excited by the potential for the Alexander community to hold hands with other experts in allied fields. And I say, I say allied field for a particular reason, that we're not in an ivory tower. Separate, elite, unconnected to the world that we are part of the world and we have our piece of the jigsaw, a wonderful, valuable piece of the jigsaw that can contribute to other people's expertise. And I think it's really not just appropriate in the Alexander world, but I think it's essential for our survival, essential for our survival, if we understand that the Alexander Technique is about the human condition. 
It's about the human condition and not some little separate part of the universe that only Alexander teachers are allowed to enter. Some sort of holy space where no one else has the key. I think the Alexander technique is a part of the human story, the human condition story, and we have our role, our expertise. But that means we need to see the human condition as a universal category. We need to see what we do in the context of other people's wisdoms and understandings over generations, and we can draw on their wisdoms and understandings and not exclude it because it hasn't got Alexander in the title. You know, Alexander's been around for a hundred and something years. It didn't grow out, grow out of nowhere. And we don't need to remain in a bubble for a hundred years, cut off from the rest of the world. And while the other techniques of somatic experiencing, different yogi systems, different mindfulness systems, different systems of trauma work, different systems of somatic therapies, mindfulness approaches in Buddhist and Eastern techniques, while they continue to grow and thrive, we are shriveling. Now, if we are shriveling in comparison to these other arenas, I think we need to think about why. What's going on? Because I think we have the best game in town in so many ways. We have something absolutely unique to offer. It doesn't dilute our work to say that we are part of the human condition, that our work is human, that our work is about how to move towards health from ill health, how to, how to move towards healing from distress, how to cope with stress in our world of today, how to work with trauma and traumatized people. Let's remember, today we have an epidemic of mental health problems. Young people, more than ever before, are struggling. And unless we just say, well, you've either got pharmacology or go to the traditional areas, we can also say that we can be part of the solution, that we in the Alexander world can be part of that solution. And to stand up and say it proudly and clearly that the Alexander Technique is a psychophysical enterprise. <coughs> so what does that mean in practice? It means that as we engage with other modalities, we learn about them, we learn what's going on in the world. We hear the language of Gabor Mate talking about the compassionate witness. We learn about the people talking the language of nonviolent communication, the experts talking about mindfulness, the therapists talking about anger management. the clinicians talking about ADHD, trauma work. You know, where are we? Where are we in the Alexander world? Where are we? And I think we should be right at the center of the conversation, right at the center. So rather than thinking that being in the conversation dilutes what we have to say, it's quite the opposite. Being part of the conversation actually enriches what we have to say because it places us in, a, in, in, in an arena of relevance for these conditions that we struggle with today, including necks and backs, but not only necks and backs. 
including performance issues for artists and musicians, but not only. So when I use the terminology of polyvagal theory, I'm not saying let's learn about polyvagal theory, let's learn about the science and the evidence and the laboratory. I'm saying the language of regulation, of co-regulation and self-regulation is a bonus for us. It's a benefit for us. It's, it enriches our understanding of what we do. And as I said, the other way around, it helps people in the other worlds of health and healing appreciate the value of our work. So why, for instance, is the terminology of regulation, co-regulation, self-regulation, down-regulation, why are these things so relevant for the Alexander teacher? Why? Why do we need to borrow such terminologies? Let's just stay within our terminology. Let's keep on talking to the world with the languages of the primary control, of neck free, head forwards and up, of inhibition and direction. Let's keep on talking to the world in terms like means whereby and end gaming. Well, we have been doing that. We've been doing that for a hundred and something years. And I don't want to be over pessimistic, but we're still pretty irrelevant. And it's a disaster because we don't need to be. Today, now, of all times, we are in the perfect place for a, for a major contribution to the health of individuals all, all across the world. We have a, a great contribution to offer. So, let's look at something like the language of regulation. Why, why is it so valuable to us? Well, let's start with the first terminologies that Alexander was using, use of the self. What's use of the self? Again, talk to the average person, use of the self, they'll glaze over. Alexander's book, The Use of the Self, that I was very privileged to write an introduction for about six years ago. What is the use of the self? The use of the self, in my understanding, is how we manage ourselves moment by moment in face of the stimuli of living. Whether we cope or don't cope, whether we react or don't react, whether we are overwhelmed or not overwhelmed to the stimuli of everyday life. Use of the self. How am I managing myself in living? How, how do we manage ourselves as we cope with stimuli from without, stuff going on out there, and stimuli from within, stuff going on inside of me, that I'll call existential stimuli. Stuff about me, my life, my history, my hopes and dreams, my traumas, my disappointments, my losses. That's all here, stuff inside of me that gets triggered. Let's use another modern word, triggered. Very close to Alexander's word, reactions to stimuli. Triggered. But maybe people might understand the word trigger. Does that mean I'm going off on trigger theory? Or am I trying so hard to say that Alexander's terminology, reactions to stimuli, can be universalized, made relevant to other people outside of the Alexander ivory tower? So use of the self. And what seems to have got lost in this discourse of the Alexander world that was very, very well known to the early generation of Alexander teachers in the 30s and 40s was that the use of the self of the teacher was the prime mover, the prime influencer of the pupil. Think about that just for a little while. The, the use of the self of the teacher had to be at such a high level that that would be the backdrop. It would be the fundamental and essential ingredient to whatever the Alexander teacher was doing. 
that that quality of use of self was primary. And without that, the teacher was not going to do an okay job. They can tell you anything they like about necks and backs, about angles and positions, about the precisions of the head forward and up, and the placement on top of the atlanto-occipital joint. They can do that till they're blue in their face. But it will not help them cope with a stimulus that normally puts them wrong against the habits of living. And as you probably know, I've just quoted Alexander. Now, unless we understand that as a fundamental ingredient of our work, and I mean fundamental, not peripheral, fundamental, we are not doing our job. So what does it mean? What does it mean to use ourselves in this particular way? That the use of the self of the teacher influences the pupil. It means there's something about the condition of the teacher that provides the space for the pupil to shift. That doesn't mean they don't use their hands in particular ways with particular skills. All clear. But it isn't some physical technique. It is not a massage. It is not an osteopathic flick. It is not heat treatment. It is not, not acupuncture or acupressure. It's use of self. This is what separates us out from so many other modalities. Again, what we have in the, Alex in the Alexander world is unique, absolutely unique. We spend three years in elevating our use of self to the point where we can have a positive impact on another human being. We do not spend three years, I hope, in learning the intricacies of anatomy and physiology. We do not spend years, three years, learning about the intricacies of the breathing mechanisms, of, of the vocal cords, of the rotator cuff. I don't think we should, if we are. I think we should be spending three years in refining our use of selves to the point where, under the cosh, under the impact of stimuli, of ourselves, our internal stimuli, and the pupil in front of us, we can maintain a condition of what we can call direction in the face of stimuli that are provoking and tempting us to go wrong. We can describe that process as co-regulation, that there are two people together and you want the influence to go towards more harmony rather than the other way around. You want the hopefully more tuned condition of the Alexander teacher to influence the pupil more than the disturbed quality of the pupil influencing the teacher. Now in a bad Alexander lesson, I'm afraid that's what will happen. In a good Alexander lesson, you want the hopefully increase in harmony of direction, of flow, of stillness, of non-reaction to be somehow more embodied, picked up, and influence the pupil. Whatever you do with your hands. That's number one. So we can call that healthy co-regulation. Healthy co-regulation. What's the purpose of this co-regulation? The purpose of the, of the co-regulation is that over time, over time, you have a hope, you have your Alexander hope that, and a strategy, that this co-regulation influence that's all very nice in the space that you have together in your room will lead to a greater capacity for self-regulation or autonomy. That's your work. Now we can debate what's the best strategy. Do we use a chair? How do we use the chair? What sort of language do we use? Where do we place our hands? And so on. But I hope that every single Alexander teacher would agree that you want to give a pupil the right experience, as Alexander said, 19 right and maybe one wrong, and repeat it so that we're creating new pathways in the brain. That's what Miss Goldie used to talk about a lot. She said, we are creating new pathways in the brain all the time. And Alexander was talking about the habits of use of self. And that's what we're doing. So I'm happy to use the language of neuroplasticity. 
wasn't around when Alexander was around. Again, I'm not talking about the science of neuroplasticity in great detail. I'm saying, can we utilize the language of neuroplasticity and say, hey, the brain is plastic. We can relearn. This doesn't undermine and dilute the Alexander work. It enriches it with the science of today. Neuroplasticity. What a wonderful idea that we can recreate the reality of the nervous system. That's hopeful. It's hopeful. Wherever you get your ideas from, what does it mean to sit with another human being who's struggling and suffering? What sort of person do you want to be? I don't think it's a, a terrible thing to say that you'd hope to have a, a growing ability to be a compassionate guide. No, it wasn't mentioned in that particular language in the Alexander books, but it's implicit. And so the work of Gabor Mate and his trauma work with addicts is enriching for us to understand that being a compassionate witness, to be open-hearted and to be able to stand your ground is a primary ingredient. And in the Alexander language, we can say, oh yes, I've heard about a similar language. It's when the teacher helps me stay back and up and open and lengthened and widened. It's the same thing. What does it mean to stay back? It means not to get overly invested in the drama, to stay back emotionally, physically. So we can understand the physical language in the Alexander model represents the emotional capacities we can talk about in the science of today. Staying back from the drama, being able to hold the space, to be a witness but not get embroiled in the conflict, to hold your space with your feet on the ground, to be in a condition of lengthening and widening and open-heartedness to the person in front of you. It's okay to talk like that because it places us not outside of the human condition but right smack in the middle of the human condition where we're relevant. We're really relevant. So self-regulation, what are we there to maintain? During the lesson, it's co-regulated, it's teamwork. And that repetition of teamwork builds up a capacity, a resilience in the pupil for new pathways in the brain to be developed and strengthened so that that resource that has been primarily activated and repeated in a lesson is more available outside of the lesson. That's self-regulation. That's use of self. Relevant, highly relevant to what we do. That's our, our game. It's a two-person game. If you want to call it an I thou relationship, how wonderful. A very holy and special relationship when, our, when we are gifted and privileged to be in the presence of another human being who is struggling physically, mentally, emotionally, and we can be witnesses and hold the space and support some sort of healing and resolution. What a wonderful condition to be part of, to be part of that process of transformation. What a wonderful profession we have. And if we spend three years, and I mean this, three years, not three weekends, but three years, we are spending three years in elevating, refining, tuning, use of self. That's no small thing. I did a psychotherapy training for four or five years. It wasn't based on this developing of use of self and self-regulation. It was mainly about, it, there were listening skills and there were certainly staying back skills. I don't discount that. But in the Alexander work, there's no hiding place. We know if we're staying back or not. We know if we, we're being pulled into the drama. We know if we are, in our words, end-gaming or efforting or ambitioning results 
we know that the result is not going to work. So in Alexander, we get this immediate feedback loop, immediate, when we are not in a refined condition, that it, does, it doesn't work. There's no flow. There's pushes and pulls and jerks. There's the absence of staying back. And we know it. We experience it. And because of mind-body unity, there's no argument. Anybody with just a few Alexander lessons knows the difference between an improving condition and a condition of habitual misuse. Everybody knows that. And so we spend three years in developing this ability. And that is the cornerstone of our work. And so if we understand our work to be this developing of capacities for maintaining a condition of regulation, of self-regulation, while we are working with other people, then the experts in the field of somatic therapy, in compassionate inquiry, in somatic experiencing, in the world of addiction, in the world of mindfulness, in all the world of the embodiment professionals, they can come to us and say, we've got these ideas, we understand what we're supposed to be here for, but what we do need is an ability to how to cope as a human organism while we're doing our techniques. We need something because we've got so many ingredients, but we keep on losing ourselves. We keep on losing the plot. Is there something that we in the Alexander world can offer? Of course there is. Because if you spend three years here, you'll be a better psychotherapist because you'll keep your bum on your seat. I remember my supervisor in, the, in, in, my supervisor in my psychotherapy training, she used to say, keep your bum on your seat. Don't sort of reach out to save them. Keep your bum on your seat. That's no different to what we're studying and learning and exploring and experiencing in our work. This is what we do. So it was all very well. She was quite right. Keep your bum on your seat. But this is where you keep your feet on the ground. Keep your bum on your seat and move. So what are we learning here in the Alexander world? We're learning to sustain a certain condition of ease, of flow, of direction and keep it going in the face of life. We use movement. That's why we use sitting and standing. Not because a chair is holy, but because it's a wonderful vehicle for keeping something going, an internal state of beingness going, while we cope with living. So you can sit, stand. You can bring in a violin. You can recite a Shakespearean sonnet. You can sing a song. You can talk politics and religion on one condition. That the teacher enables you to keep yourself in the flow, your head in gear, without being overwhelmed as you go about your daily life and perform any activity in the world. That is your role, that's your job. And if you're not doing that job, you may be doing many other things, but you're not doing the Alexander technique. Which is why John Dewey called our work thinking inactivity. It's a quality of mind, body, in, in the middle of the most intense activities where the brain is in gear, non-reactive. So we are relevant. And again, I want to emphasize now, we are relevant not only because we can use their language to help people who want to come to Alexander understand how we are relevant today across the fields, that we are relevant psychophysically for people with mental, emotional, spiritual conditions or habitual patterns, we are relevant. So come to us because we actually understand your language and we have a language will, that will help you understand our relevance. But we are also relevant to other people in allied fields. They are friends. They are not enemies. They are not out there as somehow challenging us. They're not competitors. We are all parts of, of a human jigsaw and we contribute and work together as a family for the benefit of the human condition. 
So what we have is valuable and relevant for those other works and worlds in somatic health and healing. So let's hold hands and talk about what we do with pride and recognize its relevance in the wider world. Thank you.